Uh, my name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Wynn Peterson Nedry. It's June 7th, 2023. We're at RR Vineyard in Newburgh. Uh, Wynn, thank you so much for joining us today. You bet. Uh, first question, easy question. Yeah. Why wine? Oh, um, short answer, family business. Longer answer, um, I just loved it. Uh, growing up here in Newburgh was not always my favorite, but being close to Ridgecrest, which is our vineyard here, um, was the best part of that, being able to explore outside and be one with the land here. Um, and then as I grew to appreciate wine at an older age, of course, um, it, it just became part of who I was and you can't escape who you are. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm very chemistry minded, much like my father and being a second generation in this industry that does help. Um, it's not required, of course, and there are plenty of people that do it from whatever side they want, but I feel like my upbringing and my education was pretty pretty on par with a lot of the same things that my dad did, um, in my own way, of course, but it also led me here kind of the same way he found his way here. So. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, tell us about um, kind of early life growing up in the industry and what your kind of initial impressions or memories were. Yeah, um, so we we were in Portland until I was about six, and then we moved out to Newburgh to be closer to the vineyard here. Um, so that's about when I started really remembering what was going on. I mean, I remember some of being in Portland, but most of what I recall from growing up was my time in Newburgh and up at the vineyard. We would have um, we would have parties with all the friends every Labor Day. So all my parents' friends have a couple of my friends up at the, the top of the hill here at the vineyard and roast a pig or have just a big cookout, picnic, potluck. Um, those are some of the best, the best times camping out here. And it's always right before harvest so you can go through and you know test the grapes, of course, and <laughs> see if they're ripe. But as a kid, you're just eating handfuls of really sweet, sugary grapes. So. <laughs> Um, that, that's always fun. So yeah, just being close out here, um, getting to know what my dad was doing. He made all of the first vintages of um, what was then going to turn into Shehalem. Um, but before Shehalem was a thing in 1990, he was just experimenting. Um, all of those wines were made in our garage at our house. So it was pretty hands-on when he was out there working during harvest, doing punch downs or getting grapes or bottling by hand, I could go out and see what he was doing at any point. So it was just kind of what I was used to seeing. Um, yeah, like a hobby. Like a hobby, right. So as you so as you were growing up, you mentioned Newburgh, maybe not always the place you loved being. So tell me about what you were kind of thinking about as you're going to school. What was your plan? What, what did you want to do with school and after school? I had no idea what I wanted to do, honestly. Um, as a an elementary school child or a middle school kid, you don't really have a purpose for what you wanted to do. I mean, I enjoyed the classes that I was in. I always loved science and um, math lesser, so, but um, I was always good at those scientific and analytical type of classes, so I liked doing that. Played soccer, played volleyball, um, got outdoors a lot, camping, um, but I didn't really have a good idea of what I wanted to do until maybe high school and then that was definitely more chemistry oriented. I always had strong um, science teachers that really motivated me to do more and I enjoyed science so um, it seemed easy to me. Maybe not always easy but if it was a challenge I liked that kind of challenge because it was one of those little puzzles that you could figure out and I'm one of those people that likes to have something they can take apart and figure out and know how it works since I feel like science was kind of up that alley. But I also love where I'm from and love this industry and love having grown up here, um, you know, playing with Lizzie Adelsheim and the Campbells and, you know, innumerable, innumerable um, people in this industry. So yeah, the Castiles. Um, so being part of this community was always super important. So when I went to college um, on the East Coast, 
I did love the path I was on, which was chemistry, but I definitely missed being home. And so coming back to the West Coast and particularly Oregon and the Portland area was always really important to me. And when I got back here, um, it was like a magnetic force just kind of pulled me out into the valley all the time. So I would, I had my daytime job, but then during harvest, I would spend all my free time out here helping and doing what they needed at the winery. So I eventually decided to just make it my profession because I was kind of being drawn that way anyway. I knew it was inevitable. So yeah, I decided to um, fully join on the team after a little bit of education abroad. So I decided to um, bring bring some knowledge home of my own. I had learned a lot from my dad over time just from osmosis and being there and seeing what he was doing, but I also wanted to kind of paved my own way. So I applied to UC Davis um, for my master's and went down there and spent two years getting my master's, writing my thesis and then traveling abroad. So I did two harvests in New Zealand and one in France for six months and one in California. Um, so kind of worked all over the place, but definitely was excited to be home. So came back in 2009 officially. So before we talk about that, I'm curious, you mentioned going to school on the East Coast and kind of pursuing chemistry. Um, before wine, what did you think you might do with that? Uh, I got my undergraduate in chemistry, specifically kind of the organic chemistry side of things. So after I graduated from Bryn Mawr, um, that was 2002, um, I obviously had to find a job for a little while. I wasn't going to go straight into wine because, I don't know. As, as a kid in the wine industry, the last thing you want to do is go into a profession that's part of your family's business and then realize that it's not what you want to be doing and leave. Um, so I decided to avoid that by trying other things first. So the other thing that I tried was I was in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so what I basically did was I was in a lab. I did research and development. Um, I was synthesizing organic compounds that pharmaceutical people wanted to test for activity on certain um, whatever whatever job they were working on at the time, but they would give us compounds they wanted and we would figure out how to synthesize and purify them and then send them a small amount of that, that compound to see if it had any activity. So after they checked it, if they wanted more, then we would scale it up in our facilities <clears throat> and make larger quantities, which was interesting, um, but it was also like, okay, so now you're gonna scale up this procedure that needs you to use five kilograms of cyanide. So, you know, get on your banana suit and put on your respirator and get into this giant walk-in hood and, you know, just pour that cyanide into this reactor. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> so that kind of stuff, it was a little sketchy. And I was like, I don't want reproductive problems. I don't want cancer at, you know, 30. <laughs> so some of that stuff wasn't up my alley. And I was like, I think I can do chemistry in a way that <laughs> isn't a risk to my health. So I decided wine was probably the best thing. Um, in between the pharmaceutical job and wine, I worked at Oregon Health Science University. I definitely knew I didn't want to be on the East Coast anymore. I loved it, but I missed home and this was, this was my place. So came back to Oregon. I got a job in a lab at OHSU working with fruit flies, which were much less toxic <laughs> and also relevant to wine. So I know how to make a good fruit fly trap now. <laughs> yeah, um, but worked on genetics there for a couple of years and that's when I applied to go to Davis. So I was kind of pulled in the, in the laboratory um, realm of things, but I also knew that if I really wanted to move up the ladder in any kind of laboratory job like that, I probably had to get a PhD or something like that. And did I really want to go to school for chemistry for six more years and do that? <laughs> probably not. So <laughs> yeah, that was, that was the path. I like the early adoption of fruit flies. That's, yeah. that's, that's very forward thinking of you there. So you mentioned kind of wanting to go out and get knowledge, go out and get some experience outside of what you'd known before. So tell us first about UC Davis, about the decision to go there and then about your experience there. Um, I knew that there were some great universities for winemaking all over the country and Oregon State was just coming up with their program, but it was still really new. Um, 
and everybody that I had talked to, and probably the main catalyst of this was Roland Souls. Um, he was a UC Davis grad. I used to babysit his daughter, Alexa. <laughs> so, you know, we had interaction a lot. And when I was kind of clearly interested in the wine path, he was like, you need to go to UC Davis. That's the best one out there. And I was like, all right, can you write me a recommendation letter? Like, help me figure out what I want to do there. And so he kind of helped um, proposed some questions that got my mind thinking about wine in a way that didn't have to do with my dad and what he wanted. You know, it had to do with what do you think in your brain? If you had to plant a vineyard, what clones would you choose? Where would you put it? So he started asking those questions that are probably pretty important for most winemakers to have their own thoughts in their brain about. Um, so starting with that, I just got interested. And so, um, started digging into some of the research that was being done in UC Davis and landed on um, a professor there named Doug Adams who was doing a lot of work with Pinot Noir. So he did, he did a lot of research on Pinot Noir tannins um, and so that pretty much seemed right up my alley. I mean if I'm gonna stay in Oregon I'm gonna be making Pinot and I love Pinot so um, I applied to Davis. Um, I got waitlisted initially and they were like, why do you even want to go here? You don't need to go to Davis to pursue your career. You've already got an in. And I was like, well, that's not the point. <laughs> um, I want to go to Davis because I want to learn from somebody else, you know? So I got in. Um, it was a, for them, it was a pretty large graduating class um, for their masters. I think it was the biggest they'd had and it was 11 students. So. It's not a huge, it wasn't a huge class um, in my my mind, but 11 students for them was a lot, but it was, it was awesome. It was female dominated, which really impressed me. Um, six of the 11 students were female, which was great. It's good to see that there are a lot of women out there that want to make wine. And um, I think actually of my class, more of the ladies are still making wine than the guys. So it's pretty cool. Um, and I decided to do a harvest abroad before I went to Davis because I wanted to make sure when I got there I had I could fully understand all the steps of the procedure from bringing fruit in to when it's into a barrel. Um, I'd done little bits and pieces, of course, with the family over the last you know 15 years, but I wanted to make sure that I could see it start to finish um, from my own perspective and from somebody else that was not a family member. So um, I found Claire Mulholland, who was, she was actually an intern at Shehalem for my dad in 1999. Um, and then she, she's a Kiwi, so she was back in New Zealand and she was a head winemaker at Martinborough Vineyards. So I went there and worked um, a harvest with her. I did a lot of the lab work because of my chemistry background. It worked out pretty nicely, but I also helped with all the other stuff. So being in the lab, you could see the ferments day to day as they progressed. And that was really, I think it's a huge step of the winemaking process is knowing what happens with each ferment as they evolve day to day. So I think being in the lab is the best place for somebody that wants to get that view to be. So seeing everything every day, knowing what, how the chemistries change as that happens was amazing. And then I came back for the summer and went to Davis in the fall of 2006. Yeah. So did that. I worked a uh, harvest in the middle of my two years at Davis while I was down in California still at a place called Hanzel. Um, in the Sonoma, the town of Sonoma. And then, yeah, graduated in 08, finished my thesis um, after I got back from France. So in 08, I went to France for a six month scholarship that the um, Chevalier de Testevin, uh, basically we had two, two scholarships each year that were given to Davis graduates. Um, and so, I got it and another guy that was an undergrad at the time that was graduating got it. And so we were in Burgundy for six months. It was pretty fun. Um, yeah, came back and wrote my thesis and then eventually started with Shehalem in June of 09 after another New Zealand harvest that spring. So yeah, kind of harvest education, harvest education, harvest education back. Pretty good way to do it. Yeah, it was fun. Got to go to Fiji in the meantime and Australia, that's what traveling's all about, right? Is 
getting the little vacation pieces in there too. So, so you mentioned, you mentioned, um, obviously kind of wanted to chart your own path and wanted to see things from different perspectives. So what were the biggest takeaways for you, both from sort of formal education at Davis and from seeing these other places in France, New Zealand, in California, what was different to you or maybe unexpected to you about the winemaking process? The winemaking process itself, not that much. Um, I think the winemaking process from place to place is really pretty standard. Um, I mean, there are only so many ways you can make wine. And yeah, you can add some stems here, you can put it in a different vessel, but the end point is you bring in grapes, you let them ferment, they can either do it by themselves or you can inoculate them. You probably press off the juice at some point, whether it's by hand or in a pneumatic press or in a bladder press or whatever, and then you put it into some vessel to age until you're ready to bottle. So, I mean, it's the same way we've been making wine for thousands of years. So the winemaking process itself is actually fairly similar. It's kind of the communities that were different from place to place. And I think that's always what I've thought makes Oregon really unique is the collaboration here, the sense of community, the, uh, I don't know, the sharing of information um, and the wanting everybody to succeed you know, the rising tides lifts all boats, right? Um, I don't remember that exactly what the saying is, but I think that's exactly it. yeah. So you want, you want everybody to get up to the same point so that the, you know, everybody, everybody influences how well the region does. So the more education one person can give to another and the better wine everybody collectively is making, the better the whole region is. Um, so I think that collaboration and that sharing of information in Oregon is pretty unique. Um, I didn't really see it many other places. I mean, yeah, people are friendly, people are warm everywhere, but when you talk about business stuff, not everybody's always willing to like divulge, oh yeah, I had this problematic fermentation and this is what I did. Oh yeah, try this one, I didn't really like X, Y, or Z about it. Um, can you tell me what you would do differently? You know, people, people will be like, oh yeah, no, that's great. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You keep going with that. But they don't always necessarily want to tell you what they've done in the cellar or divulge that, yes, they've had problems too. You know, it's a little bit more of a, a little bit of a fa facade in some places that I don't feel like we've gotten to here, and I hope we never do. I mean, we have gotten a lot of influx of newer money and bigger wineries and, you know, out of state, out of country investors in the Willamette Valley in the last 10 years, which is relatively new. Um, but most of the people that I know at those wineries still were either hired from other places in Oregon, so they already know that collaborative community like nature, or um, they're open to it and there, there are definitely more people in those positions that are understanding of the nature of Oregon than are not. So I think that's great. I hope it doesn't ever change. So then if the, you saw, you saw the communities as you, you kind of were able to compare the communities, uh, between here and, and elsewhere, what were the biggest then takeaways that you did bring back? What were the things that you thought, um, maybe you were bringing to the table that were going to be new or fresh ideas here? I think just having an outside perspective, a worldly view, I mean, I think that's important for everybody in their journey to figure out who they are and what they want to do and where they want to be is understanding how other people are in other places and, I don't know, just getting an, a perspective outside of your town. I know there are plenty of people that I probably went to elementary and middle school with that have never left this, you know, this county, the state, you know, not not traveled enormously. Mm -hmm. And I think traveling is really important for understanding not only who you are, but um, where you fit within the community, within the world, and um, <clears throat> understanding the way you're impacting other people. So I, I liked that global view. Um, 
and wine is something that really unites people from region to region. So being part of the greater community is important to me instead of just being part of this community. Also being able to say, hey, friend in Napa, hey, friend in Burgundy, how are you guys doing? What did you do about this? I've seen, you know, you guys had wildfires three years ago. What did you do to help with, you know, remediate that? Or Burgundy, you guys had a late freeze this year or a couple of years ago, but you know, just having people you can talk to about the nuances of winemaking and grape growing and feeling like you're part of something bigger than just yourself. Um, I think that's the biggest takeaway. I think also just improving my palate was really important. And to do that, you have to get away from the region that you're working in primarily and see what other people are doing. I had some crazy wines over the years. I went to Croatia in 2013 with um, a Rotary scholarship that was a work study exchange. So four of us from Oregon went to Croatia and four Croatian winemaking um, young, younger students came to Oregon. And we tasted through some really interesting stuff, whether it was amphora, lots of skin fermented whites, um, grapes that we'd never heard of, you know, growing, growing grapes on islands in, you know, the, the warm waters of, was it the Adriatic there? Um, just really interesting wines and getting away from what I would call a cellar palate, which could include the entire region here. So, you know, if I'm used to only tasting Willamette Valley Pinots, then you kind of isolate yourself as far as thinking about, I don't know, what else you could be doing. Mm -hmm. Which is one of the reasons I make a lot of diverse whites as well. So I love white wines. I love the diversity that having different varietals other than just Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, which are king and queen here in the Willamette Valley and rightfully so, but I also like adding a Gruner Veltliner or some Chenin Blanc into the mix and um, seeing how those are received. So when you came back to Shehalem in 2009, tell me about the initial experience for you, what your sort of role was to start with and, and how, it, how it started. So I came back in June of 2009 and I joined um, a small team in the cellar that was already pretty well established. Um, there was Mike, uh, Mike Ayers was the head winemaker at the time. And he was a Kiwi guy that had been at Shehalem since 2001. So I had known him, um, never worked with him directly because I'd only helped with harvest at that point um, at Shehalem. But he's a great guy and was actually um, partnered up with my best friend and my roommate from college. Um, she had come out to work a harvest in 03 and they ended up getting together and staying. So um, when I got there in 09, they, had, they were married at that point. I married them. Um, I was the officiant at their wedding right before I went to Davis in 2006. So yeah, Mike was my boss. I was assistant winemaker. And then Brian um, Irvine was in the cellar and Ksenia Caustic House was in the cellar also. So all of us kind of worked as a team. Um, and it was great. 09 was a really pretty cruisy harvest. So it was a good one to really get established and get my feet wet. There was a lot of fruit, but it was also kind of a drawn out harvest. And you could do like a good day's work and then sit and watch the sunset and have a beer and go home. And it was, it was nice. It was not the chaos of say 2007 or 2010 or 2011 where you're biting your nails and watching the rain or waiting for things to ripen. In that sense it was a nice nice first vintage to be here. Um, had a great team. I loved working with all of those people. And then in 2000, early 2012, late 2011, right after harvest, Mike told us that he and Hillary were going to move back with their two sons at the time to New Zealand to be closer to his family. Um, you know, universal health care and education and those kinds of things, which I totally get. Um, so they were getting ready to leave in 2012. So March of 2012 was when um, Mike had his last day and then I took over as head winemaker. Um, and at the time, Senya was still there. Um, Brian had since moved on to a new job. Um, and then we had 
we had an opening for Cellar Master coming up. Um, Senya ended up moving over to Argyle at the same time. But um, a girl that I went to Davis with, Katie Santora, um, was kind of bopping around and doing some harvest. She was going to Chile that spring, but I ended up seeing her at a winemaker dinner when I was in Salt Lake City with Jesse Lang. It was Mike Ayers was supposed to go with Jesse Lang to Salt Lake City to do this wine dinner because they're buddies and they like to ski together. And it was February in Salt Lake, so they were going to go ski for a few days too. Um, but Hillary was days away from having their second son, so Mike basically had to stay at home and so he sent me to his winemaker dinner with Jesse and I saw Katie Santor for the first time in a couple of years and I was like, oh hey, what are you doing these days? Oh, you you don't have a permanent job? Do you want to apply for our assistant winemaker position? So she ended up applying for it. We interviewed her via Skype. I think we were using Skype back then. She was in Chile. We were in Oregon. Um, and I ended up saying, you know, I trust what Katie does. I think she's a really smart person, and I think we should hire her for our assistant winemaker. So when she got back from Chile, she came back up to Oregon, and the rest is kind of history. I mean, she's been at Chehalem longer than I was at this point. So, yeah, um, that's kind of how that team got established. And so from 2012 on, it was myself, Katie, and then our cellar master, Greg. Um, Greg was a guy that had worked harvest with us in... 2009 and 2010 at Shehalem, and we ended up having him back for harvest of 2012, and from that pool of the guys that we worked harvest with, we chose a cellar master, and it was him, so. Yeah, we were a team until I left in 2018, and I think Greg left shortly after that. What was the transition like from assistant winemaker to head winemaker? Um, it wasn't terribly difficult for the Six months to a year before Mike was leaving, I think he ha he knew he was leaving before he ever told us, of course. That's usually how it works. Um, so he was making sure that I had all the information I needed to succeed and make the transition easier. So showing me how to do TTB filings and OLCC, all the, all the really exciting stuff. <laughs> um, I think the hardest part for me was probably learning internally how to manage people better, you know, because that was the one thing that you can't really teach somebody very well. It's a lot harder. Everybody's different and everybody approaches leadership and management in a different way. And so um, kind of getting my footing with that um, was a learning curve. I mean, I got all the paperwork stuff down. I got the winemaking stuff more or less down and then just getting the team as a cohesive group making sure everybody um, knew what their responsibilities were and knew how to work together and that kind of stuff was probably the biggest challenge but also the most rewarding one. What about the wines themselves? Obviously you, you took over, you, you came back to an established brand and it was you know established when you took over as winemaker so what if any changes did you make to the, the wines you're making there? Um, everybody's gonna have their own palate so obviously the way that I think something is at a great point might be slightly different than the way Mike used to think that it was ready or Harry would. So I think just those small nuances that are kind of imperceptible to us, but maybe make more of an impact on the finished wine. Um, my dad and I have very similar palettes as it is. So I think probably the winemaking style as he had it set up from even before Mike was there was probably, there was still a thread through that, that when I started making wine, um, it was more or less cohesive with what he was doing initially. So I like to think that there wasn't a huge change. I mean, we still all tasted as a team anyway. So whether it was in 2009 or 2017, everybody that was part of the winemaking team would sit down together and taste through the wines when it was blending decision time or, you know, after after any vintage, we would do that on a quarterly basis. So every couple of months, we'd sit down with all the wines and try them and see what needed to be done. And I think that's um, one of the great things about working as a team like that is you can Everybody hopefully has a good view of what you're shooting for. I think Katie still does that, and she's been the thread that has maintained that Shehalem style probably. Um, 
I haven't had some of their wines in a little while, but um, I trust her her palate, and I know that she she knows how to work with those vineyards really well. And yeah, I think I think just working as a team like that and having that discussion about everything makes make sure that the things that you're not catching get caught by somebody else too. So if I'm really bad at catching like volatile acidity and somebody else is really bad at catching reduction, we can all work together and make sure that all the bases are covered. So team winemaking, it's great. So from your time at Shehalem, as you look back, um, so what were some of, the, sort of the notable accomplishments or things you're proudest of uh, and as you kind of reflect on that time? I mean, that's that's where I really became the winemaker that I am today. So um, experiencing three different vineyards in three different AVAs for, you know, eight years um, gives you a really good view of the differences. I mean, they were all three different soil types too, the three main soil types of the Willamette Valley. So I feel like working with volcanic soil from another place is easier now and the windblown lust let the laurel wood series from somewhere else is easier so i got a great view of the nuances that not only site but winemaking technique can do so we would experiment with things like neutral barrels on riesling or stainless steel on you know whatever so um we had we had the flexibility and the volume to experiment a little bit and it really it honed in my mind what I now think of as my style um, so obviously I had to learn it somewhere and it was definitely at Shehalem um, so and knowing what tools are available too we worked with Kyriakos over a, a number of years there um, working with different lab techniques, making sure we have analysis on things and seeing how chemistries change. All of these things were really honed in there. I would, I would say just creating my own winemaking style is the biggest thing that I probably took away from that. And also knowing the importance of, um, when we did leave Shehalem, the importance of making a decision like that and knowing when you need to move on. I think figuring those things out even if it's an emotional like that was my family's winery from the very beginning from 1990 until we left in 2018 that's a long time so um but making that decision I think it was the right decision and I'm glad that we did it it was hard at the time but <clears throat> now we've got this new brand this new tasting room um it opens opportunities that you wouldn't have had otherwise so that's always great well, let's talk about that. Uh, the, with, with that decision, um, as that time was coming, tell me about sort of uh, thinking about what's next, what you wanted to do next, what what the next, what was the next step, and and, and sort of how that came to pass. Sure. Um, I mean, my dad and I had a lot of discussions leading up to he and Bill Stoller parting ways, and I think to us the biggest, most important thing to us was always the land. I mean, our family grew up on this vineyard. Um, those vines that you can see out that window there were planted by my parents and their friends in 1982. I mean, they're the oldest vines on Ribbon Ridge. They're hugely important to who we are as winemakers, um, what this region is, and all the things associated with that. It's who we are. So keeping this vineyard was always the most important part. Shehalem as a brand was always important as well, but it, you know, you can recreate brands. You can't recreate place. So keeping that was always really important. Um, and then for me, I, I did love the diversity of the wines that we were making at Shehalem, but this was always my favorite. So getting back to this land and honing in on Ribbon Ridge was always a part of who I was. So being able to express all the different wines that we make from this one site and showcasing that, I think that's really important. And then just having the capability of making all the decisions ourselves. So sometimes Bill and my dad did not agree. And being able to move forward with what we thought was right rather than what the team thought was right was what we wanted to do. So now Harry and John and I are all making the decisions instead of um, other people that don't always have boots on the ground as much as we do. So. 
So as that was happening and as you were thinking about this, tell me about sort of deciding on how it was going to work and, and how you were going to brand it and how you were going to, what was the kind of the starting a new business? How did that happen? Um, so we, the timing actually worked out pretty well for when we left and giving us enough time to come up with a new brand because Harry left in February of 2018 and then I left in March of 2018. And obviously the wines that we made at Shehalem are already in barrel, they're taken care of. Um, and we're just at the beginning of the growing season. So as long as our vineyard is taken care of, we have a few months to figure out exactly where we're going and what we want to do. We found the Carlton Winemaker Studio, which we'd always, you know, we have friends that have made their wine there for years. Um, and Anthony King being the general manager there was always a big draw. Um, he and I were friends before and he was another Davis grad. He's super meticulous and really smart and such a nice guy. So um, I knew that that was probably the place that we would end up and it just logistically it worked out, thank God. So um, it is a bit more of a commute than Shehalem from my house. So I was at a half an hour commute to Shehalem and now it's almost an hour out to the studio, but it's worth it to be in the right place. Um, so we moved the barrels that contained what we wanted to have as our Ribbon Ridge. We've, we've been making the RR brand, the Ribbon Ridge Winery brand since 2002. And that was always made at Shehalem. So we just split off our barrels, moved them over to the Carlton Winemaker Studio. And then we were able to continue um, upkeep on the 2017 vintage of RR as well as plan for the future. So um, since we are down to one vineyard now, it was pretty easy to make our label named after the vineyard, so we called it Ridgecrest. He wasn't sure um, what to do for a label, and I had, I've always been collecting his pen and ink artwork um, in my house, in my personal life. That's what I would ask for for Christmas or my birthday because I love his art. Um, he does acrylic painting too, but the pen and inks were always, it, they always called to me. And so he had some of the vineyards, and I was like, what would you think about using those pen and inks for our labels? And he. He's super modest and hated the idea, of course, so um, I told him that if he wanted to do something different, he should come up with a better idea, <laughs> and if, uh, obviously he didn't, so um, we still can't give him accreditation on the back label, but they're all his sketches, so we'd pick a different one for each, um, each of the varieties we do, each of the bottlings we do, and yeah, so we decided to call our new brand Ridgecrest. Um, we kept the RR label as well, and we decided to make that as it always had been, kind of a reserve tier um, to the Ridgecrest. So it was always kind of a reserve tier to the Shehalem, and now it was just a reserve um, to its sibling wines. Um, so barrel selection for the RR, and then the estate brand that encompasses all the varieties we make is the Ridgecrest. So we started that in 2018 at the studio. And the rest is kind of history. We've, we're growing it. We Right now, um, I only take about half of the fruit that we grow here on the vineyard. Um, and my dad sells the other half to other great wineries around the area. Um, so until we need it all, we'll continue to sell some. But I started out at maybe 25 or 30% of what we were growing here. So we can slowly grow over time and not be too big at once. Um, so there's always an outlet for grapes. Grapes are easier to sell than a bottle of wine. <laughs> Let other people deal with uh, selling wine. So. You mentioned an interest in, in white wines as well as sort of besides Pinot and Chardonnay. So tell me how that has sort of become part of the, part of the portfolio. Um, Pinot and Chardonnay are vastly important to me and always have been. But once we left Shehalem, we didn't have any Chardonnay planted at Ridgecrest. So we were pretty much left with the Pinot that we have here the Gamay and um, the variety of white wines, which is great. I love all the whites that we make. It just means that we would have to plant some Chardonnay. Um, but in the meantime, I was focusing on Riesling and Pinot Gris and Gruner Veltliner, which are the other three whites that we have here. Um, I probably drink more white wine than I drink red wine. And I would say that's probably the case for a lot of winemakers that I know, and so because of that, my palate has always been attuned to 
the wines that I like to drink. Um, so my dad and I have always kind of made the wines that we like to drink. Because guess what? If you aren't going to sell them all, you at least have an outlet for them. <laughs> uh, no, it's it's fun. They're diverse. You can do different things with them. You can put them in oak. You can put them in stainless steel. Especially with something like Riesling, you can leave a little bit of residual sugar on it. Or you can have it really dry. You can have different amounts of ripeness, so different amounts of acid. I think they're just fun to play with. Um, people enjoy them during the summer. They're always the thing that sells out the most quickly for us, but we're also only making small quantities of them. Um, so it's, it's multiple different colors in our palette of wine, right? So um, I think that was the important part. We did plant Chardonnay and a little bit of Chenin Blanc. I've been wanting Chenin for like a decade uh, before we planted it and we finally planted an acre of it so we have some Chenin now and some Chardonnay that we're going to get our first crop off of this year but while waiting for those um, I definitely made a name for our Gruner and our Riesling and our Rosé and Pinot Gris so I don't know they're just diverse they're great wines I think that's the gist of it make what you want to drink right <laughs> And you had mentioned, obviously, you, you grew up around Pinot Noir and you, and you and enjoy Pinot Noir. Tell me about um, making Pinot Noir versus making other things. Is there, has there, is there a difference? Is there something you do differently or have to think about differently when it comes to red wines? Um, I think for Pinot Noir, the key for me is the elegance of Pinot Noir. Elegance is a lot harder to hone in on and get balanced than having a big forceful red wine. Um, so Cabernet and Syrah will always bring like heft to the table, but kind of coaxing out the elegance of the tannins in Pinot Noir and not over extracting it and not also giving it enough heft to make it a decent red wine and not getting, you know, too light handed with that, finding that balance is I think the most fun and the most challenging part of making Pinot Noir. It's kind of a fickle grape so um, being able to coax out the nuances of a site or a vintage and having those show through um, and yeah being elegant. I think um, just like the way that I like white wines so much, I also like elegant acid driven red wines. So something like a fresh Syrah or a Cab Franc or Pinot Noir, those are all up my alley. I don't drink as much Cabernet or Zinfandel or Merlot as um, a lot of people might. but. It's fine, they've got their time and place. I just like them in the aged format where they're a little bit more s soft and delicate, you know, because as Cabernets and Merlots and Zinfandels get some age, they soften out and that's kind of the stage that I like them at. So I would say, yeah, elegant, acid-driven wines that show the place that they were grown. We obviously we hear that a lot, the, the idea of like showing place or showing terroir. So I'm curious in your perspective, how do you detect that in a wine, or how do you try to portray that in a wine to someone who maybe doesn't have the, the, the palate as developed as your own? If I were showing somebody what I was doing, I would probably, I don't know, I would probably focus on the lack of manipulation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we need to beat up the grapes too much when they're in tank. I think pump overs are a great option, so instead of punching things down two or three times a day. Um, do some pump overs, just give them a little, a little shower, a light manipulation. I think um, the grape skins will give off what they want to as they ferment. Um, you, can't, you can make them extract more, but sometimes you're also extracting harder tannins from if you have stems in there or the seeds or whatnot for red wines. Um, I think lack of manipulation is pretty important. Um, trying to pick at the right stage so that the chemistries are such that you need to add little to none to the ferments. Um, you might add a little bit of acid here or there, especially as the seasons get warmer. It used to be you used to add a little sugar here or there, but now it's it's gone the opposite direction, so you add a little bit of acid. but. Um, 
yeah, otherwise, <clears throat> especially with old vines like we have here, um, they do come out super balanced if you pick them at the right time. I think there, there are some wines here this year in 2022 vintage that I haven't had to do hardly anything to, you know, from the point that they came in until the point that we're going to bottle them. I think maybe I will have added sulfur and some nutrients, maybe a little bit of, you know, yeast nutrient during fermentation. And that's about it. So getting the, the sites that will give you those great chemistries and knowing how to use them well is important and then not overly manipulating anything so that it stays elegant and balanced. So in addition to working on the, your own brand, I know you make wine for others as well. Tell me about how that became part of what you do and how you approach that, that particular challenge. Sure. Uh, so when we left Shehalem in 2018, we were left with the land and some barrels. Um, and other than that, we didn't have a lot to kickstart the new brand that we were about to make. And you know, barrels cost money to buy before vintage and grapes cost money to grow and rent at a facility costs money. So in order to kind of balance all those things out, I wasn't making a paycheck um, and my mortgage still had to be paid. So, and also, I also missed the capability of working with different sites still, you know, there's always a learning curve to any place you work and any job you're in, and especially in the wine industry, you're never going to know everything. So continuing to learn is drastically important for me. So, um, I wanted to find another winemaking job while I was making my wine, um, because I was only going to make maybe 1500 cases in 2018 at the most. And that's not enough even once we start selling it to sustain fully um, throughout the year. Um, and obviously as if we start making 2018 wines in September or October of 2018, we aren't gonna sell them until they're bottled. And then the reds aren't bottled for a full year and then we'll wait a couple months on those. So, you know there's no money coming in and we're putting out a lot of money. So having a job was a great option. Um, I happened to be looking for a job at about the same time that double zero was looking for a winemaker. And I met Chris and Catherine and they were lovely people. Um, the project was exciting and interesting and focused on something completely different than what my brand was focused on. So it made sense. Um, to work with them while I was growing my brand. Um, Double Zero being Chardonnay focused and some Pinot Noir, but um, a majority of the wine that they make is Chardonnay. Uh, it was great because I've made a lot of Chardonnay, but I wasn't making any of my own. Um, they had access to a lot of great fruit, different vineyards, different viticultural regions, both for Chardonnay and for Pinot. And Pierre Millman, who was their consultant at the time, um, he would come in a couple times a year, but it was his technique that Double Zero was using um, for most of their winemaking protocols. He was, he's a great Burgundian winemaker and um, a wonderful person to learn a few things from and um, to collaborate with, especially for the Chardonnays. It was really interesting. And the technique for the Pinot was, unique. Um, I mean, snipping, snipping berries off of a, a stem for many hours a day is a labor of love, um, but it makes very distinct wines. So, you know, having, having all these tools that I wouldn't have had access to otherwise was great educationally. And also the wines were really fun to make. So yeah, I was happy to get my feet wet with more Chardonnay since we were still waiting to, I think we planted in 2019 maybe. Um, and it just made sense. They were at the studio also. So having both my brand and their brand in the same facility means that I'm not driving around all the time. I can make all the wine at the same time. I can have interns that work for my brand and their brand at the same time during harvest. It just made a lot of sense. So um, it was a fun, 
it was a fun project to be on for, I was there for four years almost. And um, I value my time with them a lot, but I started to grow and they definitely were growing quite a bit. I think the first year I was making wine with them was 32 tons or so in 2018. And then by the time I, I had to leave, um, they were almost at 80 tons, I think. So it was just the growth of both of our brands. Mine was a little bit slower, um, but they were on a trajectory. Um, I just couldn't handle all of it. So eventually had to make the decision to just do my own thing again. And at that point, at least we were selling wine and, you know, it was great. It's great. We have John. So, um, we were able to get help on the Ridgecrest side and I could still do the double zero thing for a little while until it didn't make, make sense anymore. <laughs> and now I'm doing a little bit of custom crush work for a couple of other brands, but, um, it's smaller. It's also at the studio and it keeps me involved in different vineyards and different viticultural areas, but it's also, you know, on my own time and on my own schedule and not nearly as much as double zero. So yeah, it, 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 it all kinds of kind of works out in the end. You, you ha have a certain capacity for work and when you realize you're overextending that and, um, it doesn't make sense anymore for both them and for us, then you move on and make changes. I also had a son in 2020, so that took up a lot of my free time. <laughs> so between having a baby um, and lots of work, <laughs> you have to make decisions. 2020 was quite a year, even, even more so for you. So tell me about dealing with the challenges of 2020, the, the pandemic, uh, the child, <laughs> the smoke in the, in the fall. Uh, how did you kind of, what, what, what did you have to do in 2020 to get through and sort of how did it turn out? Um, 2020 was a unique year. Uh, I don't know how else to put that. Um, the pandemic was, I mean, it's always been a, a hard time for everybody. I think, I think everybody in the, the whole world was affected in one way or another by the pandemic. Um, you can't stop winemaking when there's a pandemic going on. It's not like you can make wine from home while your wine is at a facility. So we, uh, at the studio, we just had to make provisions so that everybody was safe while doing their jobs. Um, so no visitors, very little overlap of people as they're working on their wines in the, like the non-harvest season, everybody had to wear a mask. So it affected the way that we did our jobs, but we still were there on a regular basis. Um, so I would probably come out to the winery two or three times a week to do things that needed to be done with wine and otherwise was doing planning things from home and um, being pregnant. So <laughs> let's be honest that your energy gets sapped when you're pregnant. So um, yeah, that afternoon nap was handy during harvest. <laughs> um, but the pandemic was a challenge. We obviously had to still do harvest as normal. We just didn't have any outsiders helping. So I got two great interns to help me out um, with both the Ribbon Ridge project, Ridgecrest and Double Zero. We were masked up all the time. Um, you have to be as efficient as possible. But then also, yeah, the smoke came. What do you do about that? Everybody um, that I was making wine for, we both for the Ribbon Ridge side and the Double Zero side decided to continue making wine as normal. Um, so we made all the wine the standard way we did. Double Zero <clears throat> in the end decided not to put any of their wine into bottle and so sold it all. And Ribbon Ridge, we didn't make our reserve tier Pinot, um, but we did still make wine that year. And everything has sold out at this point other than some of our Pinot, and that's just because we make a decent amount of Pinot and we put RR and Ridgecrest into Ridgecrest, so it's a larger volume than we normally did. Um, there is a, a smoke effect to um, the red wines, I think, but not in an offensive way, if that makes sense. So I feel like it's still very quaffable and very drinkable and from some of our distributors they've said it's the best 2020 pinot they've had from the willamette valley um we couldn't afford to not make wine 
you take a massive loss, I wouldn't have had a paycheck of any kind because it, I'm a self-employed, basically. Um, so my dad and I are partners in the winery. We own it together. So that self-employed paycheck wouldn't have been a thing. It's still, you know, minimal if, as it is, but at some point you can't, you can't afford to not do your job. Um, I think the fruit was still delightful. Um, and it was a very educational vintage. Um, so now I know what to do if that ever happens again. I have better techniques in my pocket. I've never worked at a smoky vintage anywhere else, so it was all new. Um, but one of the greatest things about being at the studio is being able to collaborate with all the other winemaker minds there and ask those questions and, you know, see what they're doing and get different techniques that you might not have thought of. So I think in 2020, even though working at the studio was a challenge because of COVID, working at the studio was great because of the collaborative nature of that space. So it was a pro and a con. Um, and then being able to have somebody help once Julie and my son came along in December, um, having an open facility and a collaborative facility like that, I could say, hey, Anthony, can you just check on this one thing for me? Or, hey, I've got somebody to come help me do some racking this day. Can you make sure that everything's going okay? You know, being in a space like that for that kind of time is hugely advantageous. Um, so, yeah, it was a challenging year, but it was an educational year, and I learned a lot as both a a person and a mother and a winemaker and <laughs> all of the things. So I'm sure everybody has a story about 2020 that is interesting, but yeah, I think we all learned something <laughs> during that time period. <laughs> you talked earlier about this site and, the, and its importance and, and, and kind of the continuity for, for the family and for the brand. So tell me about um, what you've done here, obviously we're sitting, we're sitting in some of it right now. What, what's been done here and, and maybe what is sort of coming next on this site? Sure. Um, so the vineyard, when we, when we got it from the Shehalem split, um, was about 40 planted acres of grapevines and about 120 total acres of land. So a lot of that is um, north facing or forested land or um, kind of swales that you wouldn't want to plant grapes in but there is still some plantable acreage and there were some things that we did want to change so um, we had a lot of Pinot Gris because Shehala made a lot of Pinot Gris um, during our time there and we didn't need quite so much Pinot Gris used to be kind of the counterpoint to Pinot Noir for a long time in Oregon while people were still figuring out what Chardonnay was doing up here um, so we decided to take out part of our Pinot Gris. We still have about two acres up there that we make some um, barrel fermented Pinot Gris from, but the extra, I think we pulled out maybe five acres of Pinot Gris. Um, we finally got some Chardonnay back in the ground. We hadn't had Chardonnay here since 2007, I think we pulled it out. And so planted some Chardonnay. We got in that acre of Chenin that I always really wanted. So those are some new plantings that were kind of more in line with what I wanted to do and what Harry thought was great too. Um, so getting those things going as well as, um, yeah, where we're sitting right now, this little house was here before and my dad owned this little piece himself as a non vineyard planted um, three acres or so that used to be a farm. And so what, we decided to do about a year ago now. Um, it was June of 2022. We decided that um, this little house here was super useful to us. Why hadn't we been using it? We had been paying for an office location in Portland to have as John's home base. John is our, my other coworker besides my dad. John runs everything for us. He's a jack of all trades. He's amazing. Um, we'll get to him in a minute. He, we worked with him at Shehalem too, and then he came over with us in 2019. Um, John and my sometime home base was in Portland. He lives in Portland. Harry lives in Portland. I live in Portland. So it made sense for us to have a home base in Portland. And we had a little stash of wine there that we could do our shipping from and all that kind of stuff. But it was in like an office building complex. It didn't, it wasn't our vibe. 
other than it being close-ish to our houses, it wasn't super convenient and we were also paying rent for it. So why are we doing that, right? So we have this house. We had a renter in it at the time. Um, he ended up finding a new place to live. And so we were like, this is a great opportunity for us to renovate this, make it into a real home base on our property where we can host people appropriately. Um, we can have more space. We can have more wine. We can do tastings upright and have it open to the public. Um, so my partner, Rob is a contractor and thank God for that. Um, <laughs> this house needed a lot of TLC. Um, so Rob and his coworker, Christopher spent many weeks up here, tearing down walls that didn't make sense, taking out bookcases, taking out fireplaces that weren't functional, removing weird like countertops and stuff. Basically renovating the entire house, drywalling everything, painting everything, everything except for the floors was redone basically, all the lighting. Um, so they spent a magnificent amount of time up here um, and made it look awesome. So now we have a place that feels good to us to host people. It kind of, it, it's very much the Ridgecrest, our, our Ribbon Ridge vibe for us. Um, so just comfortable, cozy, right at the site. You can see the vineyards and there's still a lot of work to be done. We wanna build a big deck around the whole thing. We wanna have outdoor seating. We wanna do some landscaping, put up a new fence, you know, all kinds, the, the list goes on just like anybody's house or anybody's business. But um, we do now finally have a place that feels like home to us and we can um, we can be here as much or as little as we need to be. It is a, more of a commute for everybody, of course, but that's um, that's a sacrifice we make to be more connected to our land here, our neighbors on Ribbon Ridge, um, be more part of this community. And I think that's really important for all of us. So yeah, it was just the right move and we finally had the, the capability to do it. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Rob. <laughs> And Christopher, it looks great. And you mentioned John and his role here. Um, so uh, at what, what point did he become part of the team? So John Foster, um, about the same time I was becoming head winemaker at Shehalem, we were looking for a new s sales manager at Shehalem as well. John and his wife and their young daughter, Layla, were living in the Caribbean um, in St. Thomas at the time. And he came in to interview for our our sales manager position at Shehalem. I met him. He instantly offered to drive the forklift for me for something I was doing. It was like September or October that we met him. He was like, oh, let me get on that. I'll help you out. And I was like, we need to hire this guy. He's like willing to pitch in in any area of the winery. He's great. He's really friendly. His family is wonderful. So Shehalem ended up hiring him as one of their sales managers in 2012. He and Tom Sikta um, kind of shared roles of FOB throughout the country. And um, so we started our relationship with him then. Uh, when we left in 2018, we didn't have the capacity to bring anybody with us at that time. But as we started making wine and we knew we had to sell it, we were like, all right, well, now 2019, early 2019, we need some help. Um, hey, John, would you be interested in coming over and doing sales for us as well as everything that we don't have the capacity to do? And he somehow said yes. Um, so he does everything from general manager roles to direct sales to wine club to FOB sales to banking um, to helping at the winery once it like he when I was pregnant he helped me rack a bunch of barrels and clean them and you know he'll come in and do a day of harvest work every week or so and help sort fruit and he does everything he's wonderful so um, John has now been part of our greater extended family for what 11 years or so um, so yeah uh, between he and his wife and their daughter Layla and their dog Ela. Um, they are very much the thing, part of our family, and John is the thing that keeps the Ridgecrest and Ribbon Ridge Winery cogs going. So 
you know, anybody can make wine. It's selling it that's the hard part to me. Like, I don't, I don't know how he does it. So <laughs> I guess you make good wine and people buy it, but <laughs> it wouldn't happen without John. So one of the things you mentioned earlier as you were talking about the Oregon wine industry is, is sort of it's the, the, the camaraderie aspect of it, the, the collegial aspect of it that you didn't necessarily find everywhere else you were. So tell me about as you were coming back into the industry in 2009 and, and since, uh, what your initial impressions were as, as part of the industry and, and if and how and if that's changed since you've been part of it. Sure. Um, yeah, it's it's still very much collaborative, innovative, cohesive. Um, lots of new opportunities for learning have come up. So things like the Chardonnay technical tasting, I think is fantastic. And now the Pinot Noir technical tasting, I wasn't able to attend it this year, but I think that was the first year it happened. Those things are amazing. Things like Oregon Pinot Camp are irreplaceable. And that also highlights the collaborative nature of this region. I don't know anywhere else that would host, you know, a couple of hundred Psalms, buyers, distributors from across the country and the world show them what this special place is all about anywhere other than or like it's amazing to me that 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 event happens <laughs> so things like that still very much highlight the cohesiveness of this industry i mean we knew that you know the barbecues and hanging out with all the industry children like I did when I was a kid, so like in the 80s, we aren't going over to barbecues at David Adelsheim's house every summer right now, you know? And obviously that was going to change. It happens with anything that grows and gets bigger and evolves. Um, you can't expect some things like that to stay the same, but I know that they're are plenty of people in this wine industry that I would consider friends and family that I do that with on a regular basis. And, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily out in the vineyard. We don't do our Labor Day party here anymore, but, you know, we'll have backyard barbecues and everybody's part of a different winery and we'll taste wines together. I've got a ladies winemaker tasting group that I see every couple of months and it's seven awesome lady winemakers and we've been doing it for five or six or seven or eight years i have no idea since i was at shehalem um, we've been getting together it used to be technical tastings and we'd go to somebody's cellar and taste through all their wines and talk about them but now some people are retired or semi-retired and everybody's moved on to doing different things um, for the most part and so now we just get together and have dinner instead but we still stay connected and attached and um, so s some things like the smaller groups will change but bigger things like we had a big open house here when we opened up our tasting room for industry folks and all of our neighbors showed up and said congratulations and dropped off a bottle of wine and hung out for a little while and chatted and it's still very much like your in a neighborhood, you know, and everybody on the block knows your name and you can still have potlucks and barbecues and hang out together. Um, it's just on a much larger scale and you can go to different neighborhoods too. <laughs> so, yeah. So what comes next for the industry then? What, what are you, what are you hopeful comes next or, and what are you maybe apprehensive about coming next? Hmm. I think Oregon <clears throat> will continue to grow in a good way. I think um, the tourism, as soon as the pandemic was over or nearly over, I think the flood of people wanting to go on vacation that came to Oregon during the summer, to the wine country in particular, was phenomenal. I think it speaks volumes as to how our industry is growing and um, people around the nation and around the world are recognizing that and coming here intentionally every year to taste wine, to relax, to spend a week at a rental house and enjoy the area, I think we'll continue to do that until we're, I don't know, at capacity. I don't think we're at the capacity of what our tourism ability is. I think there will always be more rental houses as they're needed. There will always be better hotels, more hotels, more restaurants. Um, you can tell just, you know, Newburgh and McMinnville alone have 
gotten so much extra tourism because of the wine industry. And I see that continuing to fuel the economy around here. Um, I think it's a hugely important part of what makes up Portland and the Willamette Valley so desirable to visit. So I see that continuing until we reach a point where we're potentially Napa or Burgundy or something like that. And hopefully still with the collaborative cohesive aspect to that. But <clears throat> I mean, the road that you guys came in here on is still unpaved. It's gravel. So there are always going to be steps um, that you can make to increase that tourism appeal. And until we're at a point where everybody's got the fancy tasting room they want and the owners didn't have to pay for it, you know, there's still room to grow. <laughs> so we'll continue to, um, I think, make those steps towards being a big tourism destination, but keeping our roots. I mean, there, there are plenty of farming um, regulations in place that we can't have big resort type things and lots of restaurants on our sites. And I think that's fine. I think um, there's plenty of room for that in the cities and towns that surround us. But I think that all the, all the wine tourism will continue to improve and grow. Um, so tell us about what's next for you then. Obviously you mentioned the, the growth here and the changes here. So what are you looking forward to ahead to sort of on a professional level and maybe on a personal level? Sure. Um, on a professional level, I would love to eventually have a winery up here. I do love the collaborative nature of the studio and I love all the other winemakers that are there. But at some point you outgrow the roommate situation and you need to have your own place. So <clears throat> I feel like I could have done with my own place after we left Shehalem because I know how to run and operate a winery facility. Um, it just wasn't part of the, the cards then. We didn't have anything up here yet. Um, so creating a whole winery with the, the plumbing and the water and the electricity and just like the infrastructure takes a lot of money. So uh, maybe one day we'll get to the point where we can have that up here. But until then, we're at the studio. Um, but as far as goals and dreams, that would be a big one. I would love to really be up here in the neighborhood. Um, and if that were to happen, I would also love to build a house up here. Um, I do love living in Portland, but I think it would be great to be up on this land and have the house that I've always dreamed of. I mean, all of these things take an immense amount of money that I don't have. So we'll figure out how to do that eventually. And it helps that I have somebody that knows how to do construction and that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, that's, that's the end goal. I want to keep learning. I don't, I don't think I will ever stop learning about wine, um, but I do want to keep my feet wet with other, other places, other AVAs, other vineyards to a certain degree. This will always be my home vineyard and the one that I treasure the most. But if you only focus on one thing, you will eventually forget to take the blinders off and see what else is going on out there. So. Um, continuing to learn, continuing to try new things, continuing to travel, all those things. So I think just what anybody wants to have a good work, work life balance, be able to spend time with their families, um, be able to embrace the moment as it's happening, um, be able to spend as much time with my father while I can and learning from him and seeing him being a grandpa is really fun, <laughs> so I think he really enjoys it too. Yeah, those kinds of things. Last question for you. Um, you had mentioned uh, sort of uh, on the outset of your journey, you mentioned kind of making your own name, especially in, in an industry where your last name was, was very well known. So tell me how you feel that's gone so far and, and um, sort of what you kind of hope that that name represents. Sure. Uh, I, th I think it's gone well so far. I feel like Everybody knows my dad, and I feel like maybe half of those people know who I am as far as winemaking is concerned. Um, a lot of people still think my dad makes the wine at Ribbon Ridge, and that he's, he's there for the blending of the Pinot. Like, we'll taste barrels together, but that's... And sorting of fruit. He definitely sorts fruit. But, 
he does his own thing. I mean, he hasn't he hasn't been the actual winemaker since before I started with Shehalem. So it's it's making sure that as a second generation you don't get lost in there somewhere. And I feel like I've done a pretty good job of doing that by having other roles and um, being part of groups and seminars and talking to people and making wine for people like Double Zero and the custom crush stuff that I'm doing, you know. Those people have never worked with Harry, but they've worked with me. And so um, kind of being autonomous and going the direction I think I want to go, making the wines I want to make. Um, and I'm starting to take the reins more and more um, as far as some of the stuff that we do with the whole business. So mm -hmm. I think I think it's obvious to the people that need to know, the people that need to know know, the people that need to know that I made wine for other people know and the people that don't care don't care and that's fine I can't change what other people do I can only change what I try to do and so that's all the questions that I have for you anything I didn't ask that I should have anything that we didn't cover today that you'd like to cover I feel like Harry's probably told our story a, a very good way but I I do want to yeah I know that I've done things that he hasn't been a part of so I'm sure that autonomy is important in the grand scheme of things and Hopefully I'm here to carry the flag for our generation until we get to my son's generation. Well, thank you so much for thank your you. time. Thanks for, for sharing, coming out. Sharing this beautiful new space with us. We really appreciate it. Um, and we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you.